Asa Bhagavato Arahato Sanya Sambudasa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Saladanto Sujedoye Alahadi Samya Samputoshe Namo Saladanto Sujedoye Alahadi Samya Samputoshe Ushan Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa the unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it, Within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Homage, you can look at the cover and we'll recite that. Homage to the Buddha's Flower Garland Sutra of Great Expansive Teachings and the Ocean Wide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo Da Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Jing Hua Yen Hai Hui Fo Pu Sa Namo Da Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Jing Hua Yen Hai Hui Fo Pu Sa So, um, Good evening, everybody. Venerable Master and Dharma Masters and friends of the Dharma. Um, we are continuing to uh, study the Avatamsaka Sutra, the fifth ground, together. And we're on page 40 and 41. Is that right? Oh, no. Sorry, sorry. Page what? 54. <laughs> Sorry about that. 54 or 55, actually. I think I... Oh, here, go ahead. Oh, yes, okay. the last verse. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So um, we'll recite, recite the Chinese and then the English. And the 54, the, the last verse at the bottom, Pusa Ju Di U Di Dran Xiu Shan Sang Ching Jing Dao Zhi Chiu Fo Fa Bu Tui Dran Si Nian Si Bei Wu Yan Dran Si Nian Si Bei Wu Yan Dran when the Bodhisattva dwells upon this, the fifth ground, he progressively cultivates the way to ever higher purity. He resolutely seeks the Buddha Dharma and does not turn back. He keeps thoughts of kindness and compassion without ever growing tired. Okay, All Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Venerable Master, Dharma Masters, and good and wise knowing advisors, good evening. Um, For those who don't know, this is Jin Kai Shi, and she's from the City of 10,000 Buddhas. Um, she works in the uh, um, girls' school there, and um, so you can ask her more about herself if you don't know her. Mm -hmm. She's okay. going to start. Okay, so I'll, I'll start by repeat, repeating the 
the sutra text, he progressively cultivates the way to ever higher purity. He resolutely seeks the Buddha Dharma and does not turn back. And we're all here cultivating and hopefully trying to cultivate to higher purity. Um, and we, there are many in the sutras, um, many wise sages that we can take inspiration from in our cultivation. And so I, tonight I thought I would focus a bit or begin with the sixth patriarch, the great master Hui Neng of China's Tang Dynasty. He's a great inspiration to, to many of us. And this great master, he was, he was one who resolutely sought the Buddha Dharma without ever retreating. He was born into a poor family, and the day after his birth, two strange bhikshus, or monks, came to his door and told his parents that they came to give him a name. So they came to name him. He was not educated, and he could neither read nor write, but one day, upon hearing a man read the Diamond Sutra, or also known as the Vajra Sutra, this Huinang became suddenly enlightened. Um, he gained sudden enlightenment. And um, prior to this, he had a very difficult life. His father died when he was very young, and he was left alone with his widowed mom. And he made a living by collecting wood in the mountains and chopping wood and selling it in the, in the marketplace. Despite the fact that he had very little schooling, he was very, very intelligent, very sharp, very keen intellect. So that when he heard the line from the Vajra Sutra, which said, the line said, one should have a true mind which is nowhere attached. When he heard that line, he immediately became enlightened. And some of us ask, gee, how come he suddenly became enlightened? But we, sometimes we forget that um, a person who has many, many past lives, and it's, it's obvious that he cultivated, he did a lot of previous cultivation in previous lives, and so that when he heard that particular verse, this the seeds from his previous cultivation had ripened, gained fruition, and he immediately became enlightened. It, it appeared that it was immediate, but it's, it's actually a, a, how would you say? The last, step of the, the last step of the way, thank you, yes. It's actually not even the last step. Not, right, right, but it, it came from a lot of past life cultivation. The result, mm -hmm. thank you. So when he saw this gentleman reading the sutra, after he heard the verse, he asked this gentleman where was he from and what was the name of the sutra that he was reciting. And he was told that it was the Diamond Sutra. It's also known as the Vajra Sutra. I don't know the Chinese. Jing Gang Jing. Okay, thank you. And so... And, and he was told by this gentleman that there, is, there was a monastery which was in the distance where this Dharma, this particular sutra was being taught by a, a particular Dharma master and there were over a thousand followers in his mountainside monastery. So he became very excited when he heard that. He thought, wow, this I can actually get a chance, an opportunity to learn this sutra. So he, in, in Venerable Master's commentary, Venerable Master Hua's commentary, he, he tells us that it was the custom of the ancients who cultivated the way to go around visiting good and learned, good learned advisors in order to find one to draw near to and to study with. So this was an oppo a prime opportunity for, for this um, for Hui Nang to to um, to draw near to a good advisor and learn the Buddha Dharma, and so 
but he was concerned about his his old mom because he was he was the prime care caregiver for his mother and also they had very little financial resources so he wondered about about her and how would he be able to go to this place of cultivation and at the same time meet his mom's needs take care of take care of his mom so um, let's see so he he was one of his customers actually offered him a pound I, I say a pound of silver maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong or maybe it was several pounds of silver that he was given and this venerable master says this was actually a karmic reward because of some past karmic condition that had ripened and so just at that point in time when he wanted to go off to study he was given this large amount of silver and that silver um, was able to support with that money he was able to support his mom pay for his um, mom's well well-being food and lodging and that freed him up so that he could go off to study the Buddha Dharma. The sutra tells us that the merit and virtue of this offering was great and that in the future this man who offered him this silver would certainly be a flesh body bodhisattva. So the silver provided for his mother's food and lodging as I said and so he was free to pursue his dreams of cultivating the Buddha Dharma. So he went up on his journey and he arrived at the monastery and he met the master and the master asked him where was he from and he replied that he was a commoner and his purpose was to attain enlightenment to become a Buddha and then the master said to him you're a southerner and southerners are all barbarians and Hui Neng then replied whether from the north or from the south the Buddha nature is one and is everywhere the same and the sixth patriarch realized that the self nature is originally complete in itself, originally pure, with nothing lacking and nothing in excess. So when the master heard the response, he he recognized that the that the patriarch to be of Huineng was a, a, a fine vessel for the Dharma. So to add a little bit more to the Buddha nature, the sutra tells us that this Buddha nature cannot be added to or depleted. It also tells us that the Buddha is not greater than an ordinary living beings. And what we living beings fail to understand, why do we fail to understand this is because we have turned our backs on enlightenment and we, re we unite with the dust of external objects. And with our backs turned, we cannot recognize the precious things that are originally ours. The sutra also goes on to say that we cast aside the roots and we grasp at the branch tips. Grasping, we grasp for fame and profit and we grasp for pleasure, pleasurable sensations, which are all false. But the self-nature, the Buddha nature of all living beings is unmoving and equal. And the self-nature includes all of, ex all of existence. So this Buddha nature, self-nature, as it's called, it's called by many different names in many different traditions, but we refer to it as the, our inherent wisdom, it's sometimes called. So this self-nature is, is the essence of the Dharma, which we are all wanting to connect with, and that's why I guess we're all here, and we're all trying to cultivate so that we can come back to our self-nature, or we can connect with this self-nature in our path towards gaining wisdom and walking to the path of enlightenment, which we're, we're all here doing. And in reference to the self-nature, I want to talk a little bit about 
the Upanishads. I'm taking a class at Dharmaram Buddhist University at CDTB, and it's on uh, the Upanishads. And the Upanishads are uh, uh, connected to the Vedas of Hinduism. Um, Upanishad, the word Upanishad means drawing near to, a, or sitting at the feet of a teacher and listening to the, the wisdom of the sages. And the Upanishads, in our class, we, we kind of all came to the conclusion that the Upanishad talks a lot about the self, capital S, E-L-F. And it's one of the, it's the central theme in this particular text of the Upanishads <coughs> that we are, we are um, studying at DRBU. It says, I'll read you a little bit about an extract, an excerpt from the Upanishads. It says, the Supreme Self is beyond name and form, beyond the senses inexhaustible, without beginning, without end, beyond time, space, and causality, eternal, immutable. Those who realize the Self are forever free from the jaws of death. It goes on to say, the all-knowing Self was never born, nor will it die. Beyond cause and effect, the self is eternal and immutable. When the body dies, the self does not die. So as I was thinking about what we commonly refer to as the Buddha nature, the self nature in Buddhism, I, you know, we came to the inner class and, uh, and as it came to my mind also that, that this self, this self of the Upanishads is also another interpretation of can be interpreted also as the Buddha nature or likeness of the Buddha nature. And we also recognize that all religions have, have this message in some form or another. And um, we are all cultivating, uh, in whatever religious or spiritual tradition we are in, cultivating to unite with this self, or this higher self, or self-nature, Buddha nature. Okay. There's another story, you know, I, I really like the Buddha Dharma, it's really, it's really chock full of interesting and humorous <laughs> stories and anecdotes of, of sages, <coughs> the sages of old, and the bodhisattvas, and the way they cultivated how they cultivated the way in their own unique styles and with their seeming idiosyncrasies. And some of them are quite very interesting and humorous. And I, I'd like to share a story which many of you, many of you probably know, but I'll, I'll go ahead and share it anyway. And this story is about a Vinaya master who was cultivating ascetic practices in the mountains, and he lived in a hut. And because he, would, he held the precepts purely, you know, he was a Vinaya, means, you know, the precepts, um, the rules that guide our moral inclinations. So he, he held many, you know, I'll just give, sorry, I'm stuttering here. For, I'll give you an example. For example, we as nuns, we hold 350 bhikshuni precepts, and the monks um, hold 250 bhikshu precepts. This, so this Vinaya master was, a, was a, an expert, and that was his area of expertise. And because he was such a good precept master, the gods in the heavens were moved by, by his cultivation. And so what did they do to show their appreciation to Vinaya Master? They would bring him lunch every day. Every day a god from the heaven would bring him lunch by noon so that he wouldn't have to prepare his own food. So he was eating heavenly food. So, 
somewhere in the outlying areas, he had a, he had a com contemporary um, who was called pa Patriarch Koichi. How do you say Koichi? Koichi. Koichi. And this patriarch was a very chubby guy, you know, he's quite portly, quite big. Masahua, in his commentary, says that Patriarch Kwechi was probably about 500 pounds, or he said maybe he was about 488 pounds the least. But Venerable Master says he was quite chunky. And he loved food, the Patriarch Kwechi. He loved to eat. And so he, you know, he was used to eating all the delicacies that man can make. But he heard about his contemporary, Vinaya, Vinaya Master, on the mountainside, and he thought, he says, you know, I have to go there for a meal and have a taste of that heavenly food and drink. He says, I wonder what the flavor of heavenly food can be like. Could it, could it be, you know, could it have contain the six tastes, or the five tastes, sweet, sour, salty, pungent, astringent, and bitter, like we have in our worldly food? Or is there a flavor above and beyond these five flavors not known to me? He was just so interested and excited to go and have a taste of that heavenly food. So one day he took off unaccompanied and he headed out. It was about a 35 mile trek according to Venerable Master's commentary. He headed out about 35 miles on his way and to go up the mountainside to Vinaya Master, to the Vinaya Master's hut. You know, he was so plump, quite chubby, quite fat. So after a while, you know, he must have gotten short of breath, you know, huffing and puffing, because it was probably hard for him to, to um, because he was so, so um, chubby, as I said. So he arrived at the hut Vinaya Master's hut unannounced 10 minutes before lunchtime. And he said to Vinaya Master, I hear that you are a Vinaya Master to whom the gods make offerings. He says, in, in my part of the country, Chang'an, I've eaten all the five flavors that man has to offer, but I've yet to taste the flavor of heavenly food. Can you give me a share of your food today and allow me to join you in your meal? Well, of course, you know, Vinaya Master, what could he say? Of course, he had to just say, agree, and he said, yes, you may join me. He says, you know, I might have to share my food with, I mean, we might have to split the portion so you might not be, eat as sufficiently as you normally do. You might not have your fill, but of course, I'll share with you. So he shared, he, he's, they sat there waiting for, for the, God to bring the food. And they waited 10 minutes, and they waited more, longer, and they kept waiting, and time passed, and many minutes passed, and many hours passed, and no heavenly food came. And the afternoon passed, and Vinaya and Kwechi was used to having his lunch, and his stomach started growling, and they started wondering, where was this God with the heavenly food? And the evening came, and Kwechi was just disappointed. He says, oh, I can't wait anymore. I, I'm just too tired. So he lay down to sleep. Now remember, he was very big-bodied. So he just kind of threw himself down, and he started to sleep. And he started to snore very heavily and very loudly snoring. And, you know, and Vinaya Master sits up meditating. And, you know, he doesn't lay down, and he thought, how deplorable. Look at this. He's a national master and he's laying down like that and he's snoring. He can't even um, maintain proper deportment in his sleep. He's just making such a, a ruckus. My goodness. And so Vinaya Master became a bit, he became a bit miffed. He became a bit, you know, upset. And he started to get a little annoyed. And as he started thinking these annoying thoughts about, Kwechi snoring and his hand banging the table and, you know, making a lot of ruckus. As he started to have these thoughts, 
the lice on his body started to bite him. Now, I guess during those times it was very common because he cultivated in the mountains and of course probably there are no facilities for him to take a bath. So it was common for him to for them to cultivators to have lice around. And so a louse bit him and he so he gingerly picked the louse off his body and he looked at it, it was quite fat, and he put it on the ground. And then another louse bit him and it was even bit pretty hard and he plucked it off really fast and he dropped it on the ground. And in dropping that louse on the ground, the louse was squashed to death. And so he, you know, the night passed. And the next morning, the next morning, I just need to retract and tell you that, of course, the Vinaya Master didn't intend, it wasn't his, his intention to kill these these lies. It just happened unintentionally. So the next morning he said to Kuei Chi, he said, how can you, you're a national master, how can you just lay down like that and just sleep, snoring and making all this ruckus and look at you, aren't you, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself, something along those lines, you know, and, and quite reprimanded him quite, quite sternly. And so Kuei Chi, with his big kapha, kapha body, um, he just, and, and it's, kapha is one of the three doshas of Ayurveda. Kapha people tend to have a lot of weight on their bodies, and, and if their kapha is imbalanced, they can, be, they can be overweight. And so he probably had a kapha imbalance when you look at it from an Ayurvedic standpoint. And also the people with kapha temperaments also tend to be very, um, they have a lot of loving kindness about them and they smile a lot and maybe you can think in your own minds of people that you know that are overweight that they kind of just la di da they maybe you know like to take it easy and relax and sometimes not get too frustrated about things and he, he just smiled at, Vener at the Vinaya master and he said you know you should be one to talk he said you know what happened last night he said, last night, a, a louse, one of the lice that you killed, went before King Yama, the Lord of Death. He went before King Yama, and he complained about you. Vinaya Master says, what? What are you talking about? He says, yes, you know, last night you were being bitten by lice, and you took one off, the first one you took off, you put it on the ground, the legs broke, two legs broke, and then the second one, you dropped it so hard, it, squ it got squashed to death, and he went and complained, he filed a complaint before King Yama against you. Vinaya Master was silent. He thought, well, how does he know that, how does he know that I was even bitten by lies? But he became silent because, you know, in cultivation, sometimes you learn to be, be silent. Actually, um, it's an asset in, in cultivation. I, I'm not very good at that, but anyway. So he was silent, and, he, and then Kwechi, um national master, said, yes, this is what happened. So Vinaya Master looked on the ground, and sure enough, he did find the two lies, one with the front legs broken, and the other one was squashed. And he, um, and he, he thought, well, wow, Kuei Chi must, maybe must have some, something going on, must have some skill, I, I, I really don't know, I, I don't you know, know what's going on, I, how could he have known this? Anyway, Kuei Chi left in a half, he says, you know, I came to eat heavenly food, and even that, you couldn't even, there was no heavenly food, you could not produce heavenly food, and I hear that you eat heavenly food every day. Um, so he left in a kind of a, a huff. And after he left, the, the God that, is a, that normally brings him the food brought, his, brought the food to Vinaya Master. Vinaya Master says, what happened to you yesterday, guy? You know, yesterday, we, not only was I hungry, but I had a guest. You didn't show up with any, you didn't bring any food 
nothing at all. My guests went hungry. I went hungry. You could have at least notified me a day ahead of time to let you know, let me know that you weren't coming. And the, so the, the God explained to him, he said, you know what? This is what happened. Yesterday I had the food. I was flying on my way here to bring it to you. And you know what happened? There was a blinding, brilliant, golden light that was surrounding your hut. All around the radius of your hut, for many miles, there was this brilliant light. It was so blinding that I could not see to make my way to you. It was too blinding. And I was wondering about that, and I went and asked the local earth spirit, what is this bright light? I can't, I can't find my way to Vinaya Master. And the, the earth, local earth spirit explained to me that you had a visitor, Vinaya Master had a visitor, who was a uh, flesh body bodhisattva. <coughs> he said, that, that light is being emanated from this flesh body bodhisattva who is there visiting, and that's why you can't make your way, because the light is too brilliant and too blinding. So when Vinaya Master heard this, he recognized that he recognized that the Kwechi, who he was reprimanding earlier, who was snoring, and you know his snoring just sound like you know the drum and bugle core, and he was just he Vinaya Master had thought he was quite you know obnoxious. Vinaya Master now recognized that. He was a flesh body bodhisattva, and he felt very badly that he had that he had judged him. So that's a that's also a, a kind of lesson for me, and a lesson for maybe some of us to realize that we shouldn't we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. That this was a great bodhisattva, and like many others, you know. Like I said, with seeming idiosyncrasies, we don't we don't know what lies beneath that that veneer, that was just a lot of great cultivation and and um, spiritual practice that that wasn't obvious because we you know we maybe were judging by the ex external exterior. I want to talk a little bit about the Vinaya. I was talking about Vinaya Master. Talk a little bit about the Vinaya. <clears throat> the Vinaya is one of the three divisions of the Buddhist canon. Is it the three baskets also? It's sometimes called the three baskets, is it? Yeah. Um, and it consists of the rules of discipline and training, dealing with morality or precepts. And like I mentioned before, the women. Um, who become fully ordained, we take 348 precepts, and the males, the men, take, who become fully ordained, take 250 precepts as bhikshus or monks. So that's one division. One division of the th three baskets is the Vinaya. And that's the third division. The second division is the sutras. And the sutras are discourses by the Buddha, or discourses given with the Buddha's authority. And the, the, sorry, the first division is the sutras, which are discourses by the Buddha. And then the second division are, is called shastras, which are discourses or commentaries and assorted writings on the Dharma. For example, different individuals giving their interpretations of materials found in the sutras. And um, I, I especially appreciate Venerable Masters commentaries also, he writes a lot of commentaries on the sutras which help to clarify. So had it not been for many of the shastras or commentaries by the Venerable Master, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be able to make head or tail of some of the sutras, but, but given those really wonderful explanations brings a lot of clarity. And um, these, so precepts are designed to protect us from the three poisons of greed, anger, and delusion. And we, in, in our cultivation, we learn to be humble and kind. Those in high positions and low positions should be courteous and polite to each other. 
And we should try not to speak of the shortcomings and faults of others. That's a hard one, you know. Especially, <laughs> especially when we're working closely together with people and we're, we have deadlines to meet and we become frustrated. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes I forget. <laughs> Why did she do that? Why did she say that? You know. But we should try our best to recognize their strengths. We should try not to speak ill of others. And instead of being envious, we should be joyful about the successes and rewards that others receive. Basically, we're all cultivating, trying to, we're working at changing our negative habits. And that's a major feat. But it's, it's extremely beneficial for our spiritual growth. Correcting our failings gives rise to wisdom is one of the lines from the sutra. I'll read it again. Correcting our failings gives rise to wisdom. The sutra says, the sutra adds, concentration comes from holding precepts, and with concentration, one can bring forth wisdom. If our minds are filled with greed, anger, delusion, obstruction, jealousy, etc., then concentration and wisdom are useless. They're not present, according to the sutra. And the sutra gives an analogy. It says, as a, lamp produces, as a lamp produces light, so concentration produces wisdom. As light is the function of a lamp, so wisdom is the function of concentration. But despite the discrimination, concentration and wisdom are fundamentally one. I want to just pause here for a moment and um, ask or encourage you guys, if anyone wants to share any experiences or make any comments or anything that they'd like to share, please feel free to just raise your hand and we'll get you a mic. And you can, please, you can interrupt at any time. Do you want to say anything yet? Okay. Simplicity in living. In CTTB, we try very hard to. We 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 do live very simply in City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, and um, we try to tread lightly on the earth, and um, we we just you know we do our best. And so I, in living simply, we encounter life more directly. I was reading an article by Duane Elgin about simplicity in living. And I'll share some of what he said. He said, in our search for aliveness, genuineness, authenticity, we cover ourselves with layer upon layer of fashion, cosmetics, fads, trivial technolog technological conveniences, throwaway products, bureaucratic red tape, and stylish junk, he adds. He says that the, f the hallmark of a balanced simplicity is that our lives become clearer and less pretentious and less complicated. To find balance in our lives requires that we understand the differences be between our needs and our wants. For example, we need certain things in order to survive. We, we need shelter, of course, in order to survive. But we may want a big house with many, many rooms. We need transportation, of course, but we may want a very expensive car. So in in being able to gain clarity on our needs and our wants is a, is, a, is a step in the right direction. Life can become clearer and less pretentious and less complicated. And also being aware of our consumption patterns. And so in our, in our ethics class, at, I teach the ninth grade, ninth grade et girls ethics, we look at globalization, consumerism, the global footprint, and um, we recognize how much, how much we we consume and how much we we waste. And um, it's it's a transformative 
experience because then you can be more we can look into ways and means of of decreasing our wasteful habits and um, living more in keeping with what nature provides us rather than uh, rather than what's the word I'm searching for a word rather than wanting yeah good thanks rather than wanting endlessly and, and wasting endlessly uh-huh And many, many of us who strive for simply living have become aware that the earth does not have sufficient resources and sufficient environmental carrying capacity to allow all the people in the world to consume at their current rate. So simple living can help us to develop patterns of consumption that are globally sustainable and that use the world's resources wisely and do not overstress the world's ecology. Actually, um, I was just thinking while Jinkaisha was talking um, about the globalization and um, just reflecting on an interesting thought, well, to me interesting, um, how right now um, we see a lot of, or I get sent some articles in, from the New York Times where um, mainstream people and scientists are saying, you know, for to fight global warming, everyone needs to eat less meat or avoid cheese or um, things like that. That is really the solution. And also, more and more people are coming into the mainstream and saying things like that. And um, recently also, I learned about an organization called Dharma Voices for Animals. It's, um, it's basically some Dharma practitioners from different traditions um, who are trying to uh, make their Dharma communities more um, living in accord with the compassionate spirit of the Buddha. So primarily um, there's some uh, Tibetan and Theravadan teachers who are, you know, trying to work on this. And um, it, it started me to think about why the Chinese Mahayana tradition of Buddhism is kind of unique in holding up you know, full vegetarian for the monastics at least, and promoting vegetarianism so strongly. So it, I found out really interesting um, that um, there's, I think there's several different reasons. Um, some of it is based in Chinese culture and what happened in the history, and and then also an interesting phenomenon about four centuries ago in the late Ming Dynasty, when they were there was also a like an the first wave of globalization happened then. There was the trade, where there was um, silver being mined in South America, and a, I think a, a great percentage of it, at least half, was coming into China to purchase, for Europeans to purchase the porcelains and silks and teas from China. So there was all this trade, and at China was experiencing some new affluence, and the, you know, not only the elite were able to enjoy um, sumptuous meals and so forth, it was kind of trickling down and um, the literati, were, the intellectuals, were getting very um, worried or concerned because ordinary banquets were being so sumptuous. They were like what the emperors of old used to, to serve. So um, they started this trend of becoming more frugal and promoting vegetarianism. It sounds a lot like today, except maybe today is even on a huger scale. So, but I would like to trace a little bit some of the main um, points in history um, that caused this phenomena, and maybe we can learn from it a bit. Um, so, uh, we can draw from a couple of you know things in the Chinese classics. Mencius has a passage where he's talking to the um, Liang Hui Wang, King Hui of Liang, how um, a gentleman or an exemplary person. 
um, when it comes to animals, if he sees them alive, he cannot bear to see them die. If he hears their cries, he cannot bear to eat their flesh. And, but his conclusion then was just, well, so a gentleman should stay far away from the kitchen and not, not be around when the animals are killed. Um, but, and then also how Confucius, <coughs> um, if he did go fishing, he would use a hook, not a net, so he would only you know, catch one fish at a time. And he would never shoot at a roosting bird, a bird that was not flying. Um, so, and then Mencius also talked a lot about how every single person has this sprout, this like um, tendency towards humaneness and compassion. And he gave an example. He said, if you saw a, a toddler crawling towards a well and about to fall in, because in, the wells were level with the ground, um, you would naturally have a reaction <coughs> of being worried and, and scared. You would, you know, want to go save the child. And if you don't, if you say, oh, I cannot, you know, be compassionate towards people, he was talking to this king, why, why aren't you taking care of the people starving on the streets? He said, if you, you don't do that, it's not because you're not able to. Everyone has this natural capacity to care, but it's just that you choose not to. So um, you're basically harming your own compassionate um, nature by ignoring it. So, and um, actually the, the monastic precepts, um, it's true, they do not explicitly prohibit meat in the same way that the bodhisattva precepts very explicitly do so. And so in India, um, there are the people who you know, they will say, well, the Buddha allowed monks to eat meat. Um, there are later, um, the Buddha in like the Lankavatara Sutra says that that was just an expedient and it was not real meat. I was creating this for you because not all of my disciples, you know, and also not all of my lay followers were Buddhists. They were offering food and I was just trying to draw them in, things like that. Um, so, however, there were monks in India that chose to be vegetarian, um, but it was, and then in China, there were also um, monks who chose to do so, but it wasn't total. It was not widespread at, at the very beginning. So, um, there was a monk in the third to fourth centuries named uh, Zhu Dun, and he was known for his um, lecturing on sutras and also being a literati and and he records that um, he argued with his teacher his master that it's okay to eat eggs actually because the sutras doesn't say anything about eggs and he says it's not the same as taking life if you eat eggs um, and then he said well, after his teacher died um, he suddenly saw his teacher appear before him and throw an egg on the ground and the egg broke and a chicken came out, a chick. So then Zhu said, okay, I think I was wrong. So he became a vegetarian for the rest of his life. And um, in the fourth and fifth centuries, um, several sutras appeared or, and were translated in China, um, including the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra and the Brahmanet Sutra and the Sharangama Sutra. All of these stressed very explicitly that um, that people should, the, it's, to be vegetarian is highly, you know, it's, it's good. And, and because of this, then there was this kind of discrepancy between the monastic precepts, which were not explicit, and these sutras, which were explicit. And the literati, who were lay Buddhists, they read these sutras, and many of them decided to promote vegetarianism or become vegetarian at least part-time or on certain days or certain months. Um, there is, was, many of them were also in high positions like an official in, um, named Zhou Yong. He was trying to, um, he wrote a letter to his friend He Ying or something um, who was already partially vegetarian but trying to convince him to completely renounce it. And he's, he's saying um, that maybe you're being kept from the loftiest state of cultivation because you're not completely vegetarian. 
how can um, gentlemen of good intentions not embrace reciprocity and bring peace to an with animals? Um, for the animal, it is its life at stake, and it holds on to it dearly. For us, it's just a flavor, something we can do without. Um, and watching animals drink and eat, fly and swim, we feel compassion for them. How can then? How can we then club them to death and eat them so casually? Um, and then we we form herds of livestock and we. We fence them in, and then we wait for the day when we can cut them apart. Um, although you do not personally slaughter living creatures, you can't resist supplying your butcher with geese and carp. A moral man rejects goods that have passed through the hands of bandits. <clears throat> when, a li <clears throat> when a life is given over to the knife, how can a compassionate heart bear it? Um, so all creatures receive a given form, a storage house for their skin and flesh. All, come, all comes from compounded delusion, flowing on like the water of a river that cannot reverse its course. We are also born into filth and pollution, and we make a long, sour journey through the world of suffering. The sweetness and fat of flesh only cause the consequences of ignorance to accumulate. How can you continue to sully your belly with the oily meats? Um, and so forth. There was also a poet named Sun. Sun Rie, um, who also in the fifth century, sixth century, who also wrote a treatise on the ultimate compassion. And he was friends with the prince of Jingling, um, who also pro promoted vegetarianism and also had a, a big influence on Liang Wu Di, Emperor Liang. And also the Zhou Yong, the previous official, his son also served at Liang Wu Di's court. So and argued in favor of a ban on hunting. And Emperor Liang Wu Di was very um, special. He ruled from 502 to 549, and he um, was a devout Buddhist from early on. He take, took the Bodhisattva precepts, and he renew, renounced all meat and fish, and only ate vegetables and fruit and grains. And then he also forbade um, animal sacrifices in the ancestral temple in the fam in the imperial family, and he banned hunting and fishing near the capital, even though many officials objected. Um, um, so he had been being influenced by all these officials and reading the sutras himself, so he really wanted to influence the monastics to become completely vegetarian. So in some early 6th century, he called a grand assembly of over a thousand leading monks and nuns. And then he had two of the monks expound the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra on the part that talks about not eating meat. And then he, he also um, read his own essay um, for, on renouncing meat. And the essay actually scolds the monastics as being hypocrites because they're preaching on these sutras and yet they are still eating meat. And um, and and so forth. He continued with a second assembly, where he ordered the monastics to debate this issue and then go back and teach these um, sutras to their followers. And then he issued five edicts, talking about the karmic retribution of eating meat. And interestingly enough, while he was a Buddhist doing this. In the northern Zhou, there was a non-Buddhist, an anti-Buddhist ruler, who also criticized um, Buddhism, uh, criticized the monks for eating meat. So the monastic establishment at that time was getting all kinds of social pressure from the elite um, officials and the literati, and of course with internally as well. So um, and and um, then later on, there were also many um, great masters like. Um, Qing Liang Guo Shi and Hui Yuan Da Shi, Fa Zhang Fa Shi, Kui Ji Zhu Shi, and Zai Ren Da Shi. They all wrote about being vegetarian, and and also Dao Xuan Lu Si, who was also in the story, the the Vinaya master. He um, also argued in the commentary to the fourfold Vinaya that um, a butcher sells only to those to, who eat meat. 
And so if there is no one to eat his meat, he will not slaughter. Um, so we see that the one who eats meat also creates bad karma along with the butcher and is um, implicated in the act of killing. We all know this now, but this, is, this, was, being, this was a theory being set down in the 7th century. Um, and then once it actually became the norm in the monastic community to be full vegetarian, then the monks went on to urge the lay people to also become full vegetarian. Because before they were just saying, you monastics, you should be our models and you should be perfect. But they themselves were not being full vegetarian. I mean, not all of them. So then after that, it turned around and the monastics um, started uh, writing and in their Dharma talks, emphasizing it, um, like Zhong Mi Zhu Si, caused many people to change their profession from butchering and harming living creatures and stop becoming vegetarian. So at that point, the monastics embraced, embraced vegetarianism all at that point, did they? Yeah. So it became the norm by the 7th century. And, and then later on, I mean, and then from that time, the Tang, Tang dynasty and the Song dynasty, many literati also... Um, practice vegetarianism and also liberated life. They they would go to the market and see a captive, you know, bird or a fish or a turtle and say, "Oh, I want to buy one and liberate it on behalf of my father or whatever." So they would do this um, on an individual basis. But then, let's go forward a few hundred years to the late Ming Dynasty in the 1500s and and then the early Qing Dynasty in the 1600s. It became much greater in scale. There was a, um, there were became there were lots of clubs or societies, f- because at that time it was a trend to form these form clubs for everything. Um, but there there was clubs for jia sa fang sen, meaning non killing and releasing uh, life, releasing creatures. Um, there were also clubs they call, well they call them like tofu or something. I don't know exactly. This is a translation from bean curd societies. <laughs> so I guess it's vegetarian societies. Um, and it was, it became a social status symbol. If you, it, you showed your moral superiority if you released creatures on a regular basis, like they would gather every month, every member would bring a creature to release and they would do it together. And then there were all these functions, um, ponds for liberating life and river sections of waterways for that were um, fishermen were not allowed to fish in, um, and then there would be stele and inscriptions about this, and lay people wrote um, essays, poetry, didactic stories, moral stories talking about. And okay, and the other changes in the past. There were stories talking about the karmic retribution, so it was more out of a fear thing. Like I don't want to, if I eat animals, I'm going to get eaten in the future. So that's the fear motivation. But by the late Ming, it was more about emotional identifying with um, the animals. Like they would talk about more weak and helpless creatures, down to insects, and how they all love life and they all don't want to die. And Let's see. So here's one example. Um, somebody named Feng Shike, um, a Ming official and writer, he once begged his, and this was in the Ming biography, he met, begged his friend to spare the life of a rat. And when asked why, he said, well, he and his brother, both scholars, they had a lot of books. And the books were always, you know, the problem was rats would get to them and chew them up. So his brother thought, ah, oh, these rats are bandits. So he would carefully wrap his books and seal his house and try all kinds of ways. And he had a cat too. And then no matter what he did, the rats still got to his books. But Feng Shike would just say, oh, you know, the damage that rats do is, you know, if they take a little grain or they chew a little book, it's nothing compared to what a thief does when he steals grain or what the corrupt officials do when they rob the whole state, right? It's a tiny, it's... it's trivial damage. So he didn't do anything. And in his house, the rats became so docile, they would leave their droppings around, but they wouldn't touch his books. They wouldn't even touch food that he left out. So he said, you know, I don't see why I should kill them, why they should get killed. And um, the record also says that he 
donated to have shelters built for these crowds that would come to hear lectures about saving lives. So at that time, you could see the society was really into this. Um, and then there were many, and this is not all, only Buddhists, there were many Confucians who said they were anti-Buddhist. They won't talk about Chan or Buddhism, but they would also say they, it's wrong for a gentleman to, to kill or to, to take the life or to cause suffering to creatures, many, many creatures, just for the sake of flavor. Um, one, one guy, Qian Qian Yi or something in the... 1582 to 1664, he said, the ancient rulers, meaning like the sage rulers, Yao Shun and so forth, considered heaven and earth, the mountains and forests, and the rivers and marshes all as one family, and the birds, beasts, and fish, and the myriad living things all as one body. And um, another person, uh, Meng Cao Ran, he wrote something called the Guang Ai Lu, which is the records of spreading love, and he, this is non-Buddhist as well. He said, um, that eating beef is like being unfilial and inhumane. And it's something, and non-killing is a way of cultivating one's benevolent heart. And then uh, Lian Chi Da Shi, you all know, the lotus pool, great master, Zhu Hong, um, he also used many different ways to say, well, you know, you don't have to eat meat. There's plenty of delicious plant-based alternatives that are available, and you, you, um, there are many ways to prepare them. You can make them into dumplings, you can make them into cakes, you can pickle them, you can boil them, and so forth. Um, and the other thing is, at that time, as there was this affluence in the society, so people were giving lots of banquets, and then it became fashionable to be frugal at banquets, so people would say, okay, we're gonna limit the number of dishes and the kind of dishes we serve, and that's in good taste. Um, so it was, vegetarianism was not just a personal choice, it was actually social action. And because there were these stories of karmic things too, like there was one um, where they said um, a boat was supposed to be capsized or something, it, fell, it went to a storm, but it survived because there were vegetarians on board. So just the fact of having a vegetarian on board could help the whole boat. Anyways, this is what people, it was common for people to be thinking in this way. And uh, they would say things like, in treating guests with respect, whereas before you would, in the older thinking, you would think, you want to give your best, you know, most extravagant meat dishes. Now you have to treat guests with respect. You al also include love for animals. And this is very Confucian because on the one hand, Confucius disapproved of extravagance, needless ex extravagance, and also took pity on animals. Um, And, and then some people would just try to get people to um, put, their, put themselves in the bodies of the animals, saying, this person named Zhi Dalun um, said, people who go fishing do not see that it suits the true natures of fish to form schools and ride, ride the waves in contentment, meaning they value their freedom too. And this sounds a lot like Zhuangzi people I mean, he talked a lot about how animals don't like to be caged up or put in, killed and put into sacrificial, um, for sacrifice and so forth. So, and then, here is one quote which I really liked. Um, Zhou Meng Meng Yan from the Qing Dynasty, he wrote, he's trying to um, really put, put the connection between men and animals, I mean, humans and animals. So he says, although men and beasts differ in their shapes and bodies, they are actually the same when it comes to feelings. Watch how they are when they are about to be caught. They'll squeal and screech, jump over walls and climb up buildings, just as we do during political chaos. So if there's a war or something, everyone's trying to run away and get to safety. And then he's talking about the animals again. The parents are at a loss as to what to do, and the wives and children have no escape from death. Are they different or not? Watch how when one decapitates chickens, if one chicken is killed, then all the chickens will shriek in fear, and when one slaughters one pig, then all the other pigs will refuse to eat, just like us. So this leads me to um, say a little bit about jumping back to the 21st century, um, 
you know, nowadays, it's just, back then, you could see all the killing. It was right out in the market or in your own house or wherever. You bought the animals live and took them home a, a lot of times. But nowadays, it's very different. There's this distance between what was an animal and what's on your dish, what's on your plate. And um, I was just reading an article in a book um, about this, this guy. He was writing about how just in a generation's time in Canada, there used to be, I forgot how many, the mil- uh, like a million pig farms. And there were like family farms, each with just you know, a couple dozen pigs or something. And, and that was, you know, and the pigs, you know, had a great life until they died. You know, they were out in the outdoors and in nature. And, and they were actually treated well because um, there was not too many. And the farmers actually have a bond with the animals they raise. Um, this is an, on an aside. An, another story that came out recently was um, somebody who does the local food movement you know, raises, humanely raises, um, I think it was also pigs, that he loves these pigs, and he develops really good relationships with them. And then he finally came out and said, since I love my happy pigs, it's really not ethical for me to kill them. And he said this in the New York Times, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, or some big paper. And so you can see that how he went an extra step. After he went already to being much more humane and so forth, then he was able to take the next step. Um, so, so this, okay, so in a generation, it went from millions of pig farms, each with just, you know, less than 100 pigs, to now only um, 6% of the farms in Canada are pig farms, but each farm has like 900 pigs on it, and I think there's a total of 13 million pigs or something in Canada. However, if you go to Canada, you won't see a single pig because they're all far, far away from people where the public can see them. And and this pig farmer who wrote the article said, back in the day, you know, because the weather is so cold up there, um, sows, female pigs, would only give birth in the spring or summer. Um, in the winter, they would rest. But now, because they're indoors, um, they can control the environment. So they're making them give birth like three times a year because that's as much as they can cram in with their natural cycle. And originally, um, in the natural, you know, because sows are really big, their piglets are just this big or smaller. When they're feeding, nursing a, a litter of piglets, sometimes they will roll over and crush them by accident, and this happens in nature. However, because the farmer wants to get every bit of piglet out, so then they would confine them to these um, farrowing crates or something. It's where they're, they can't move, so they won't roll over their piglets. And the piglets are taken and put on the su- other side of this little bar thing, so they won't get under their mum, but they can reach through the bars and get milk. So at, the farmer said in the old days, you would only do that for the first few days of nursing. Now they do it for the entire time. The piglets and the p- sow are just in that little place the whole time. And then actually, and then there's another time when I guess they're before they give birth, they also are confined. Um, and so basically it ended up from a completely outdoor life to now a completely caged life. Never see the, the sun or the grass. and. And then they're kept in really, really cramped and dirty quarters and treated like um, machines, basically. And then, um, because I went to this Dharma Voices for Animals website, there was this YouTube on there, many, maybe it's been gone viral, so I don't know if you have seen it, but it's actually very hard to see and I couldn't finish watching it. It's by Paul McCartney and it's called Glass Walls. And then basically the line keeps, they play is, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be vegetarian. And I mean, you've all seen many other movies like that, but this one is particularly, um, they're uh, brutal. So I'm just going to describe a few scenes from it and you can imagine it for yourself. Because um, even with so-called free range birds, um, they are crammed like 
probably thousands in a room like this. So they're basically on top of each other and on, they're you know, defecating on top of each other as well. Even though they're not in cages, it's not really called freedom. And often the birds will get hurt or injured or some sick. And then, so there are these undercover videos where the people in the slaughterhouse, and this is not even slaughterhouses, this is where they're raising them, poultry farms, they go in and how do they deal with those that they want to get rid of? They just break their necks. And they're, they're just, it's really hard to break these necks. And then they're just twisting the neck of a turkey or something. And then the piglets, they're also raised in these little big, big batches. And then they're all bloody. And then some of them don't make it or some of them are like half alive. So what do they do? They take these little piglets and just slam them against the ground to kill them because they want to get rid of them. As for the chicken, chicks, um, for the dairy industry, and then for, so for both for milk and for eggs, the males are useless, sorry. <laughs> so they have to either get rid of them or they raise them for meat. So um, the male calves become veal calves and they're killed at one to four months old. Um, being separated from their mother on the very first day so they don't take any mother's milk away from humans. And then the um, chickens, the chicks, um, the male chicks are immediately just usually thrown in a trash can where they crush each other and suffocate. Or they're, even worse, they're ground up for fertilizer, live. And then, okay, so I'm sorry to, but it's really shocking and it's just, um, if we think about the people in the Ming Dynasty who cared about seeing individual animals, you know, being butchered or whatever, um, just imagine that now multiplied exponentially, but all behind closed doors. So nobody really feels the pain or sees the pain. They can't, their compassion, their, that humane heart that Mencius talked about can't even arise because they didn't really make that connection between the chicken patty or whatever and what happens to produce that. So these chickens, the way they're thrown, you know, they have to be moved from cage to cage or different stages of their life. They're tossed like this, like people would throw a ball, you know, into the cage and shoved against each other. Or when they're being moved to the slaughterhouse, they're shoved into these really tight crates and then travel for, you know, hundreds of miles without food, water, or anything. Um, so that's why, fortunately, there are lots of caring people, um, like people in the Dharma Voices, or tomorrow um, we are actually attending this conference called the United Poultry Concerns, and they're having their annual conference right here in Berkeley. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually called the Conscious Eating Conference, right? And it's a whole day of speakers um, talking about from, from sanctuaries, from those creating vegan products, those working for laws for chicken welfare, poultry welfare, and so forth, all coming together and just trying to see what they can do because of the 10 billion animals that are killed for food in the United States, land animals, not including seafood, 9 billion are choked chickens because chickens are the most popular and they're smaller and so forth. And chickens are um, very intelligent and bright um, creatures. So it's, it's just in, unimaginable the kind of suffering that um, not only are we subjecting them to, but the slaughterhouse workers to be in that kind of environment where you have no choice because you need money um, and you go for that kind of job, it turns you into a, I don't know what, um, something like a Hitler, I guess. So you have to be really compassionate for that too. Um, you want to say something? There's a, I, in terms of just something just popped into my mind. We have a few more minutes. I just thought I'd say it. Um, I was visiting family in New York this past Christmas, and there's a section, you know, in New York, in New York City, you know, you have the industrial district, and you have the, um, the, the village, and you have different districts, and you, and there's a district called the meat packing district, and and that meat packing district now is being you know is being is being um built up is being they they use the word gentrified and it's they're having they have lots of popular 
restaurants and fine buildings in that area. And um, there was a, a young friend of my family, her, her, it was Christmas time, so all the businesses give Christmas parties, and she, and she had gone to her, her Christmas party, her businesses, her work, Places Christmas party, and it was being held at a at a big restaurant in this meatpacking district, and and she just she, you know there was a lot of a lot of trouble in that area. She she was to make a long story short. When she was leaving the the Christmas party, she got um, she was her car was being towed away, and she was in it and in the car and she wouldn't get out so the 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 guy the tow truck guy called the police and the police dragged her out of her car and put her into handcuffs and it was a whole you know she was really manhandled they were f by these young cops and she did it and the cops um the cops said oh yeah this you know in this area this happens all the time all these kinds of things happen all the time and so it, it it was it turned into a kind of big affair because she was she was um manhandled and the the point i'm trying to make is that what was said by the police is oh this the meat packing in the meat packing area oh these kinds of things happen all the time people get um, their cars get towed, and there's a lot of trouble. The police get oh, the police gets called to that that area, the meatpacking area, all the time. So, it 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 kind of made sense to me because I I imagine that, you know, all the energies from from the the beings that were killed maybe would um, generate a lot of negativity and so that negative things would probably would more than likely happen which is what the which is what was confirmed and people that live in New York know that you know although this is a gentrified area and it's all built up and they have famous restaurants there but it's it's an area that you want to stay out of because you never know what's going to happen so that's just a little aside um, I I want to get back to the sutra and talk a little bit about merit and virtue um, and, and the sutra talks about merit that's created externally. So when we do good things, you know, um, we create merit. But virtue, virtue is accumulated internally. So, uh, and recently heard a story about a, a, a man who poses as a beggar. Well, they call him a beggar. He's not really a beggar. He's a 96-year-old man in Bulgaria. And his name, I call him Elder Dobry. And what this gentleman does is, every day he goes out to the, he walks many kilometers from his home in Belovo to the city of Sofia, which is near the nearest city to him. And there's an Orthodox um, cathedral there. And he sits outside the cathedral and he holds a plastic cup and people drop coins in. And over, the, over a long period of time, he's collected and he collected um, over 35,000 leva, which, is, which translates to about 20,000 euros, which is over 20,000 in US dollars, you said? Euros. euros over 20,000. 20,000 euros. Would it be? Oh, okay. Over 40. Oh, a lot, of a lot of, yeah, a lot of money. And he collected that money and he donated it towards building towards the church and towards building monasteries and particularly you know he's he he when he was interviewed he said i want to help to to build the monasteries especially monasteries that are you know falling apart and churches that need help so i, w I was quite moved to hear that this old man and he's hunched back he's 96 years old and that this is how he how he spends his time and what he dedicates. He could have kept that money for himself. He lives on a pension of about 60 euros a month, but he does this because, because of the need to help support the churches and monasteries in Bulgaria, in his town of Sofia. He looks like Santa Claus. <laughs> he looks like Santa Claus, yes. I want yeah, <laughs> he, <my beard. laughs> yes. 
he does look like Santa Claus hanging to his right. So, um, uh, and also that brings to mind a story that you probably all know of. It's called The Old Man of Mount Way. Um, and Hengen sure reminded me that he is. Tell me who the, he's. Uh, he's our patriarch. <laughs> he's the Zong. He's the uh, patriarch of the Wei on Zong, that the master of, um, um, inherited from Master Shiring. Oh, okay, okay. And so this uh, this old man of Mount Wei, as he was called, he was an old cultivator in the mountains, and he was in a hut cultivating and um, and. Uh, the the local people and the government local government got wind of the fact that there was this cultivator living in a thatched hut and and so one of the government ministers came by one day with with a large sum of money and offered him to build a monastery and he just sat there in meditation and and he just kind of pointed over to the grass when the Minister, government minister asked, where should I put the money? And he pointed over to the grass and he just kept on meditating. So the, the guy, the government minister put the money down and left. And sometime later when this, they expected, when it was sufficient time that maybe a monastery would be built, this, this minister, government minister went back to check to see if the monastery was there and how the monastery was faring. And he saw no monastery, and he thought, what's happening? What, what happened to all that money I gave to this old cultivator? And he looked around, and sure enough, he saw the old cultivator was there in his hut, in the same fashion, and just sitting there cultivating. And, and he asked him, you know, what happened? Where's all that money I gave you? And the cultivator said, huh, what, what are you talking about? And he reminded him that he had brought this large sum of money. And he says, well, where did you put it when you brought it? And he, he said, well, you told me, I put it over there in the grass. He says, well, go look. And he went and he checked. And sure, it, sure enough, the money was there in the same fashion, the same, at the same location that he had put it um, maybe years ago prior to that. And, and so the government minister realized that, okay, this, this, this old man of Mount Wei, um, he, you know, he just didn't care about money or maybe, you know, so he himself took it upon himself and he, he had a monastery constructed, constructed there. So that's just an example of, of how some people have let go and these ancient sages of past, how some of them have, you know, not put any importance on on finances and on um, ac uh, accumulating wealth. And I think our time is up. Are there any comments or questions, if if or announcements? We have an Amitabha recitation session tomorrow from 7.30 to 5 p.m. So if you want to recite the Buddha's name, you can come and recite the Buddha's name. Yeah, and then I think have um, a company for the dedication of merit. So, um, so we're doing the English version, right? Am I right? Yeah. May every living being.
has found a sign Break the darkness of their endless night Because our hearts are one This world of pain turns into Now we'll just um, do three bows. Thank you.